the internet started out with a vision of anyone can get a computer, anyone can go online, and anyone can communicate directly with anyone else. But now that hasn't gone away, really. I mean, even, it, or is it, are it you saying that? It hasn't gone away. Okay. But what has happened is that the power and the profits have gone to the very few with the new internet that we're building. We are changing the rules once again. At the 2017 Consensus Conference, an eclectic group including technologists, bankers, and libertarians assembled in New York City to discuss blockchain technology. It's a relatively new branch of computer science that some claim will eliminate the need for middlemen in many sectors, giving rise to a vast new peer-to-peer -peer economy. One of the most ambitious companies in this space is Blockstack which is attempting to use blockchain technology to rebuild the internet without intermediaries. The goal, according to co-founders Munib Ali and Ryan Shea, is to put individual users back in control of the web, thus reducing the power of both large companies and governments. Google has this saying, don't be evil. Maybe a company shouldn't be powerful enough that they're sitting there thinking, should I be evil or not? What does Blockstack do and why is it needed? So I think you should think of Blockstack as a new internet, almost like a second internet or a parallel internet to the traditional system that we already have. And uh, so it, is, it gives you the full stack. It gives you the, the entire internet infrastructure that you need, like right from like downloading a browser to you type in like a domain name and how it's resolved and how the data is uh, presented but it's designed in a, in a very different way from the traditional technology. I mean, the traditional internet is like 30 years old. Uh, there are a lots of like security problems or reliability problems in the core design. And what we did is that we basically did a complete clean slate design using blockchain technologies. Yeah, I mean, the internet was designed to be decentralized, right? It was, it actually started out that way and there's been a consolidation. At the end of the day, you have to rely upon Facebook or Google in order to access the internet. What is bad about that? Because doesn't that mean that they are getting a sense of who you are and what kinds of stuff you like? Any central repository of data on like millions of people is basically like a honeypot. It will get hacked. Or the, the NSA or some other uh, government agency or some other country would try to get access to that data. The fact that it's available means that it can be used in negative ways as well. These honeypots, Ali says, are the data centers maintained by these internet giants, which are where most online information is now stored. So how does Blockstack propose to alter cloud computing, which has brought enormous efficiencies to the tech sector? Ali and Shea say they've worked out a way to turn these facilities into the equivalent of storage lockers, where individual users are the only ones who hold the keys to their own data. So if you're a Dropbox engineer, you can actually go through all of my files today but the way Blockstack works, when I use Dropbox, again, the same service, but through Blockstack, mm -hmm. the, their engineers have no visibility into the encrypted blobs of data that is actually being stored there. It doesn't matter if it's provided by Dropbox or Google or Amazon, they're being reduced to these like dumb hard drives that just stored encrypted data. The theoretical challenges in building this new internet architecture were the subject of Ali's Princeton PhD dissertation, which he successfully defended last month. And it was here on the Princeton campus that Ali and Shea met in 2013 and decided to start a company together. Now Blockstack has raised close to $5 million in venture capital. It has seven employees and the development team is expected to double in the next few months as it builds the foundation for this new internet. None of this would be possible if it weren't for the invention of Bitcoin, which was introduced to the world in a 2008 paper written by a pseudonymous developer. It also described a new type of distributed ledger for keeping track of who owns what Bitcoin called a blockchain. Blockstack is part of an entire industry that's now emerged, which is all about integrating the blockchain into everything from real estate markets to driverless car technology. What is the blockchain? One way to think about it is a white pages that the community maintains together and anyone can actually add to it and anyone can publish and distribute it. One important part about this white page is, is that no one actually controls it. There's no intermediary. No I can intermediary. send something directly to you or to you. 
I don't have to drop it off at a post office box and then the guy will be like, okay, this goes over here. You can walk right over to the address and put the, put the envelope in the person's mailbox. How does Blockstack work like that? So in this case, Blockstack gives you your own secure mailbox where you can actually store all of your data. So it's important that you have this open public resource, which is this white pages that we all collectively maintain, to help us find each other's safes so that we can put, help put things in each other's safes. And only you have control over your own property, your own address, your safe, your mailbox, and only I have control over mine. Ali and Shea say that these shared digital white pages are what make possible a fundamental reordering of the internet structure. Today's web is dominated by a handful of applications owned by private companies that keep track of our data, identities, and contacts. The only part of the internet that's currently open and decentralized are the programs we use to connect to these walled gardens, which are called protocols. But now that line is being redrawn because many of the internet's essential functions no longer need to be handled by a centralized entity, thanks to blockchain technology. That leaves applications like Twitter and Facebook playing a far more limited role. It's almost like Twitter would be like a radio, like an old style radio, where you turn it on, you can, you can push your stuff through it, but when you turn it off, they don't have a list or data of everything that you've That's a really good example. If you think of Twitter as like a radio, then you can go to any provider and buy a radio set that you like using and just use that for connecting to the same network. Right? So by doing this separation of like what is the app that you're using and the data is actually separate, Right? And you can actually switch these apps. You can, uh, let's say some other competitor comes around and they're like, uh, why don't you use my app? Then the users get more choice in like whatever software they use to actually produce the content. Why would Twitter be interested in going along with this at all? The way that this can change, the way that actual decentralization can come about and a very competitive market, right? Real free market mm -hmm. economics, the way that real free market economics can emerge instead of monopolies is with business models that allow these small groups to bootstrap networks and to get user adoption and to get paid and to be able to actually sustain themselves so that they can grow, right? So what we're doing with Blockstack is we are enabling small open source groups to actually grow and compete with the large players. This new internet will undermine government's ability to access users' personal data without permission. The Snowden leaks revealed that the NSA was strong-arming internet companies into letting them read the digital files of users. By migrating all online information into these encrypted storage lockers, Blockstack would make mass data collection impossible. It seems to me that that's an open invitation for the government to say, no fucking way. We're not saying that there shouldn't be a role for government to be able to knock on someone's door and, and ask to see right. the data there. We, we don't, we do not believe that there isn't a role for that. But in the traditional world, in the world before the internet, the way that that would work is individuals would get surveilled one at a time. You would have a subpoena that you have to get from a court, and then you could use that to actually go after an ind individual, right? Yeah. That is, that's the model that we've worked with so, for such a long time, and it's worked very well, right? We've now entered a world where everyone could be, can be surveilled simultaneously for no co almost no co additional right. cost, no marginal cost, right? So we have this dragnet surveillance where billions of people are getting surveilled at the same time, and it's just being plowed into these massive, massive buildings right. with data on everyone and every single conversation, on every single intimate uh, experience. So again, I, I get why, as, as a user, I, would, I don't want that. Yes. And as a company, I see uh, an opportunity to say, hey, we're going to pull your data out of that and it's going to be in this secret you know, cubbyhole that the only way the feds or whoever, I mean, or a corporation can get to it is by coming to your door and asking for it. Yes. Um, but then why would, the, why would the government allow something like this? So I, I basically look at this as like mathematics. Mm -hmm we can just wait it out and somebody else would do it. Mm. But this is a world where I don't see any possibility where you can actually like ban encryption. Governments would actually just need to learn to be smarter. So, I mean, really what, it, what you're saying is that the encryption will always be ahead and that the government will have to switch its model from a dragnet surveillance to, now we're gonna have to only 
go after people who we have a suspicion of. Yeah, it's, it's not like a software problem. Mm -hmm. Think of encryption as like uh, al almost like a physical concept mm -hmm. that you cannot deny physics, you cannot deny mathematics. Yep. Encryption exists kind of like in a similar way and we will have to learn to live in a world where it exists. Blockchains have solved a very key problem and which can be used for build the rest of the internet stack. Right? Blockchain At the consensus stack. conference, BlockSec released an early version of its decentralized web browser, and the company held a special session for developers to answer questions and encourage them to start building applications on this new platform. Assuming that people move towards this model, how will it affect the distribution of small, medium, and large companies in, in a given area of service? Whenever there's a rule change, you see a few players emerge that quickly are able to understand and play the rules, play the rules better than anyone else. And they, that's when they gain enormous amount of market mm -hmm. share. Right? You see the internet did this. New companies were born and some existing companies had sl started to wane a little bit. If you can change the rules, if you can allow for new business models to emerge, if you can allow for open protocols and open source software to be monetized, if you can create a system where companies can compete on a, le a level playing field, and consumers can move from provider to provider, then that rule change can allow for a new wave of companies to emerge. And I do believe that this will create a much larger ec economy and a lot more prosperity for everyone. It'll help consumers, it'll help business owners, it'll help a lot more people to create sustainable businesses.